from the border of the United States and Canada. Welcome to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up this week, why Tadej Pogacar is already the greatest rider of all time. Watch it and weep, Mercs fans. We've also got a new bike from Canyon, stats showing more people clocking more rides, shed wars, and someone backflipping a Brompton. This week in the world of cycling, we learn that it's not nice to be yesterday's news. No, this is a photo of four-time Tour de France winner Chris Froome trying to persuade a security guard that he should be allowed access to this year's race. You had the same issue, actually, didn't you, Dan, this year? I did. Uh, even if you finish 161st 14 years ago, you're not coming in, apparently. <laughs> uh, anyway, thanks to Hilda Davidson-Nielsen for allowing us to use that photo. Yeah, we also learned the details on the bike that's been propelling Mathieu van der Poel in recent weeks. The new Canyon Air Road was unveiled, and yes, they have made it faster, and yes, they have made it lighter, but they've also made a host of other refinements as requested by their pro riders and pro mechanics. Nice. Uh, meanwhile, over at the Tour de France, we also learned that Biniam Gomai not only became the first black cyclist to win a stage of the Tour de France, he went on to win three plus the green jersey, becoming the first African cyclist to win a jersey overall. Just like Richard Carapaz became the first Ecuadorian cyclist to win a jersey by taking home a very well-deserved climber's jersey. Yeah, wrestling it off Tadej Pogacar, which is no mean feat really, is yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Because what can you say about that man? I think we learned not just this week, but over previous weeks, months and years, Pogaccia is potentially the greatest cyclist of all time. Well, just before we dive into our evidence for such a bold statement, we should probably point out that in 2018, we claimed that Peter Sagan oh, could did, be we, yes. the greatest cyclist of all time. Uh, which he wasn't in the end, was he? He was No, he wasn't. He was very good. He was good, yeah. But he wasn't the best. <laughs> And then three years after that, we made an argument for why Van der Poel would become the best of all time. Which he isn't, is he? No. Yet. I mean, I don't think he's going to get there either. I don't think he is either, yeah. But basically, every three years, someone comes along, don't they? And we get a bit excited. <laughs> so maybe yes. you can take what we're about to say with a pinch of salt. But is Pogacar genuinely different? Is he the rise to finally usurp Mercs? Yes. Well, at the start of this season, he himself stated that his aim is to become the best rider of all time. And more than a few people scoffed at that, yeah. didn't they? But four months and 21 World Tour level wins later, that dream, or goal in fact, has just become a lot more realistic. Should we delve into the stats a little yes, bit? Yes, let's delve. Uh, two months short of his 26th birthday, Pogaccio has now racked up 84 pro wins. By way of comparison, the very same age, Chris Froome, who couldn't get into the tour, Bad luck, Chris. he had racked up no wins. Zero. Nada. Zilch. And to put that into perspective, even Dan here had one pro win <laughs> by that age. Yeah, my first one and my last. Uh, Froome, of course, then went on to win six grand tours, of course. Yeah. Anyway, perhaps a better comparison for win rates in modern times would be the likes of Peter Sagan or Mark Cavendish. Wout van Aert or Mathieu van der Poel. He is ahead of all of them in terms of number of pro wins, monument wins by the same age, Grand Tour GC wins, of course, because none of them have actually won a Grand Tour, have they? The only thing he falls short on is World Championship victories by the former greatest of all time, Peter Sagan, because uh, he won one, hadn't he, by his 26th birthday. He had, yes, and that actually can't change for Bogatja this year because a very hilly World Championships takes place in Zurich this year. Year, almost exactly a week after Bogatja will have turned 26. Ooh. He's got four and a half thousand meters of climbing though, so it probably is his best chance so far of winning that coveted rainbow jersey. Yeah, and cementing a triple crown. The second do, rider yes. in history? Or did Merckx get it as well? I think it's, was it not Le Monde Roach? Le Monde didn't get it, did he? Did he not? He didn't he anyway. want a Giro, did he? I'm not really that good at stats. I'm not on the hoof. Anyway, uh, right, we should cut to the chase, though, shouldn't we, yeah. really? Um, I, how does he compare to the man widely regarded as the greatest male rider of all time? Mm. 
Eddie Merckx. Well, he's ahead of Merckx in terms of Tour de France stage wins by the same age, 17 versus 14. I think the trouble for Pogaccia is that Merckx went on to win a further 18 stages over his next three participations wow. at the race, so an average of, of six per edition. Yeah, now we have just witnessed Pogaccia taking six wins in a single tour, but maintaining that isn't going to be easy, no. is it? So whether he can get close to Merckx, and then, in fact, Cavendish on stage wins, will likely depend on his longevity. Yeah. I mean, he is 13 years younger yeah. than Mark Cavendish. So in theory, he only needs to average a little over one stage per year if he carries on as long as Cavendish did. Yeah, should he ride every edition. Well, true, yes. Maybe he needs to watch your videos to help with his longevity. Yeah, focus on strength, muscle mass. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Sleep, VO2 max. all of those How's things. How's your VO2 max today? <laughs> Anyway, we can make all these statistical comparisons, but for a long time we have said that the modern peloton is different. Mm. It's not possible to dominate now in the way that Merckx and to a degree Bernardino and others dominated their heroes, and therefore it is impossible to make a like-for-like -like comparison. At least that was a theory, wasn't it? It sort yes. of appears to be a much more uneven playing field again at this point, akin to that Merckx era where one rider was, on their day, better than anyone else in almost all aspects of the sport. Yeah, and I think that's where Pogaccia shines, isn't it? In their prime, modern greats, such as Van der Poel, Sagan, Froome, Contador, they have all been the best at what they specialise in, be that one-day yeah. races, yeah, and Cav, stage wins, Grand Tour, GC, sprints, whatever. Pogaccia can seemingly do everything. Exactly, yes. One-day classics on cobbles or gravel, stage races, Grand Tours, time trials, you name it, he can win it. Uh, the only race he's unproven in thus far is Paris-Roubaix, and you'd imagine he'd fare pretty well there, considering how he looked over the Roubaix cobblestones at the 2022 Tour de France. I think he'd be all right. I think he'd win Paris-Roubaix if he had mm. a pop. Um, personally, anyway, part of that all-round ability, you've got to say it's down to his bike handling, isn't it? He doesn't crash no. very much, does he? Like, a small one on stage two of the Giro this year, a big one at liege bastogne liege last year, I can't really remember many more. There haven't been loads, have no. there? No. And that is reflected, actually, in the number of DNFs he's had in his career. So this is one of my favourite facts about Pogacar. He has never pulled out of a UCI-ranked stage race. And that goes back to a first-year junior in 2015. Wow. Since then, he's done 41 stage races, totaling 324 days of racing, and not once in all of those races... Has he DNF'd? That is bonkers, isn't it? Not once has he crashed hard enough or got ill enough to pull out of a stage race in close to nine years. And that in itself is quite remarkable, mm. isn't it? Like, I don't know, maybe... Well, I think hopefully everyone can understand that. But if you've ridden a stage race and you know how many people drop out... Yeah. Like, it is. It's absolutely bonkers. There's a risk of crashing every few minutes, really, isn't there? Well, yeah, there is, yeah. Um, now, is it luck or judgment or genetics that he doesn't get ill? I've got to say it's judgment, personally. I mean, I've got a theory that all pro riders are faced with a similar amount of bad luck through their careers. It's just that some, like Pogacar, are better able to deal with that bad luck than others. Yeah, like Roglic, you mean? Exactly, yes. Harsh, but fair. I'd well, say. it is, yeah. Because you're right, like, you don't get lucky riders or unlucky riders. They're all in the same peloton, right? Well, yeah, not unless you believe in that hokey-pokey stuff. Hokey-pokey stuff. Hocus-pocus stuff. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I don't believe in hocus-pocus or hokey-pokey. <laughs> uh, any more Merckx comparisons you'd like to draw down? Um, well, there is the fact that the only other non-sprinter to have won 12 Grand Tour stages in a single season is Eddie Merckx, and now Pogaccia, of course. Or uh, well, that Pogaccia has now surpassed Merckx for most days leading a Grand Tour in a single season. But I think the real argument as to why Pogaccia is the GOAT... It's just the speed and power at which he's currently riding. Yeah, nobody has ever ridden a bicycle as fast as Pogaccia over so many types of terrain. Nobody for the past few decades has had anywhere near his consistency. For the last three years, he has won his final race of the season. For the two of the last four years, he's also won his first race mm. of the season. And only once in 25 pro stage races has he finished outside the top six. <laughs> And just finally, if Pogaccia was a team on his own, he'd be leading the World Tour level wins classification. So he's won 21 races this year, all of them at World Tour level. The best teams are Alpecin, Sudau, 
UAE without Pogacar and Visma Lisa bike, and they've only won 11 World Tour races each Whoa. versus his 21. So he is effectively single-handedly outgunning teams with budgets of 50 million euros. <laughs> Not... I mean, he needs his team around him, of course. He does. To enable him to take those wins. Yeah. But it just shows the disparity between him and everybody else this year. Uh, should we rest our case there and throw it out to the audience? What do you think? Do you think that Tadej Pogacar is the greatest male rider of all time? If not, do you think he will get there one day? I think he needs to win the gravel world, Dan, personally. Like Merckx. And yeah, and like Eddie Merckx. <laughs> well, Eddie Merckx would have won the gravel world, wouldn't he? Um, and maybe have a pop at Unbound. And then once he's finished with that, I'd mm. like to see him win the cyclocross world champs. Yeah. Uh, take it to Vanderpool. Stop him becoming the greatest of all time. And maybe some bicycle gymnastics thrown in there for good measure as well. Well, he can do wheelies, can't he? And he, he can do unicycle. Can he? Yeah, he's yeah. good on a unicycle. Oh, that's cool. Me and, me and Tade have got something in common there. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, and then mountain bike as well. Because why not? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's got a lot to prove still, hasn't he? He has, man? yeah, youngster. Not multidisciplined at all. <laughs> Whippersnapper. Anyway, yeah, get involved in the comment section. And now it's time for Cycling Shorts. Cycling Shorts now, and as mentioned in our introduction, Canyon have launched a new aero. Now, Alex was invited out to Canyon HQ to not only ride the bike, but also meet the engineers behind it. What was interesting, Dan, I thought, was that they set out when starting to design this bike to survey all of their pro teams to find out if there was anything they wanted to change on the outgoing model. And do you know what the pro teams asked for? Stiffer, lighter, faster, <laughs> uh, also some other cool stuff too. Uh, watch the video for the full lowdown on that, but the end of the bars can be changed from standard road drops to aero drops, which are super shallow, super long, and flare from a narrow setting of 35 centimeters at the hoods to 40 centimeters at the drops. Yeah. You know, it's easy to scoff at stiffer, lighter, faster, isn't it? But actually, as a pro cyclist, that is effectively what you want your bike is, yeah. to be, isn't faster. it? Faster. Just a faster bike, yeah. So uh, anyway, I thought that was, well, they tackled it with a plum, I think. Uh, right, moving on from tech, Garmin published an analysis of their users' exercise data, and they have seen a 7% increase in cycling activities from existing users this year compared to last, which I think mm. is really cool. And even better is that women cyclists increased participation even more. Yeah, what's interesting is that they dived into the data a little more than that, didn't they? The most powerful riders, are from Denmark. Average of 196 watts normalised. That's a lot, isn't it? Average. Yeah. But the most miles most miles ridden per person, sorry, are Belgian cyclists. 362 million miles in total, which is 30 miles on average per member of the Belgian population. There you go. I would say it was down to the weather and the great roads <laughs> they have there, but it's clearly not. It's a culture. However, thing. yeah, I'm pretty sure they don't have issues with bike shed wars. In the grand scheme of wars, they're not the most serious bike no. shed ones, are they? But on a personal note, they can be really frustrating and they are definitely an issue, as summed up by this story from Ireland, as reported by road.cc. Yeah, so in essence, a family created a pretty decent looking bike and bin store, multi-purpose mm. shed, on their driveway, so they could more easily ride their bikes because they could get at them, and therefore, use them more frequently. However, the local planning department has ordered them to take it down because it was, and we quote, visual clutter. Though. Visual clutter. Visual clutter, yeah. Worse though, the planning inspector in a bonkers peat of short-sightedness said that the reduced driveway space would impact road safety because more cars would need to be parked on the road as a result. Without stopping to think that what is in the shed might mean one fewer car on the roads in the first place. Yes. What is even more stupid than that is that there are no planning rules about cars and trailers. So this family can replace their, I think, good looking bike shed with a massive trailer and just keep them in there. And the council can't do anything about it. And in fact, they could keep it on the road in a giant trailer and the right. council can't do anything about it. But as soon as you try and park your bike on a road, uh -uh, not allowed. Uh, anyway, councils, Certainly here in the UK, they're all exactly the same. Cork County Council in Ireland, you need to have a word with yourselves as well and get over your car brains. Rant over? Rant over. That was yeah. a good rant though. Yeah, it was yeah. a little bit, yeah. All right then, Leah Wilcox updates. Woo! By the time you watch this, 
She would have clocked over 10,000 miles since she started riding 56 days ago. She's over halfway now and so on track to take the record, but she's been slowed down by some grim looking Australian winter weather. This is the round the world record, of course. Yes, we should probably have said that. Shall we? Now, I don't want to sound all Canadian here, but seriously, how bad can an Australian winter get? <laughs> well, nothing compared to a British winter without yeah. damp cold. Yeah, I exactly. Would say. Which is much like a British summer, isn't it? With a damp <laughs> cold, except when it's hot here, in which case it is hotter than the sun, isn't it? Why is that? I've got no idea. Do you know? Do you know? I think that like you go outside in the UK and it's thirty degrees, and you're like, "This is ridiculous. I'm melting." And then you go to like France, it's thirty degrees. You think, mm. "Oh, this is nice." Maybe we have a different way of measuring temperature here. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, next up, you might have watched Sai recently racing a Brompton folding bike and thought it seemed like a strange thing to do, but then take a look at this. Team GB Olympic BMX hopeful and world champion Kieran Riley taking a Brompton to a skate park, hitting some quite frankly massive ramps and even doing a backflip. I honestly did not think a Brompton could do that. No, I mean you've struggled with your backflips on one, haven't you? I have, yes, can't do one. No. Anyway, Brompton are equipping the GB team with a fleet of 60 limited edition P-Line bikes basically zip around Paris on. There you go. Now That's we, cool, isn't it? it is very cool. Um, we might not be able to backflip Bromptons, no. or backflip anything, in fact, <laughs> including ourselves, but one thing we seemingly can do is influence global geopolitics and also sport. Yeah. And so it has come to pass once again, just three weeks after we said that boring sprint stages are hampering the popularity of cycling, the route director of the Tour de France, Thierry Gouvenu, has hinted that there will be fewer sprint stages because organisers there say we're a bit disappointed at the lack of action. So mm. there you go. Well, what would you like to see happen next, would you say? Well, I feel like we need to think big with this kind of power. Why limit ourselves <laughs> to just the Tour de France? Um, something I've noticed. Should, should we point out to any new viewers, I mean, we might not have any, but we are you know, talking in jest here, aren't we? We don't really believe we have that kind of influence over these sorts of authorities. Well, you... Just, like, just seems coincidental that a few times in the past half of a year, action has been taken. When it happens that frequently, Dan, I'm beginning to think it's not coincidence. Um, as you know, I don't believe in hocus pocus, but... Uh, all hokey pokey. All hokey pokey. Right. Um, but no, I mean, were we to have significant influence in global geopolitics, mm. I th we need to think about a few American cities are rolling out what's called Vision Zero, which is where city authorities are committing to try to reduce road traffic fatalities to zero through mm. planning. San Francisco cyclists were celebrating a new protected bike lane down 17th Street, uh, but there's a vocal opposition who see it as a threat to their freedom to drive wherever they like. Yeah, so not just shed wars this week, but kind of road mm. wars, isn't it? I mean, they're minorities, right? But I don't know, it's not like nice to read about. Well. Wars full stop, obviously. Well, yeah, like actual proper ones. Um, anyway, you could just do uh, what Daniel Lloyd lookalike Hugh Jackman <laughs> does and uh, cycle to red carpet movie premieres instead. Technically, it was a yellow carpet, wasn't it? But it was, hopefully that doesn't change it. No, principle stays the same. Uh, again, for new viewers, I sometimes get compared to Hugh Jackman, which I obviously love, but I think somebody a few weeks ago summed it up saying, this guy on the right looks like Hugh Jackman if you bought him off Wish. <laughs> I think that's what people mean. Very slight resemblance, but uh, yeah, nothing like the real thing. <laughs> this next part of the show is where we do hack forward slash bodge of the week. Uh, don't forget you can get involved in this part of the show. All you need to do is go to upload.globalcyclingnetwork.com to submit your hacks or bodges. First up this week, Jane uh, sent us this. Recycling chamois from Threadbare Cycling Shorts. Perfect use for old cycling shorts. Just cut out the chamois uh, of the shorts, obviously after you've boil washed them. <laughs> Perfect size for getting between chain rings. You know what? This is actually a really good idea, isn't it? Yeah. I had never ever considered using my, my threadbare cycling shorts to buff my bike. And it, admittedly, when you think about it, it is a bit gross, but you know, a boil wash, yeah. I mean, that's going to get rid of it's most nasties. Is it setting, is it, on a washing machine, a it, boil wash? It is, yeah. 90 degrees it goes out. Crikey. I mean, I can't imagine it's particularly eco-friendly, so maybe stick them in your favourite saucepan and just boil it away. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know what you've got to do with the saucepan, put that in the washing machine <laughs> on a boil wash. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, oh, what's, what's the worst that's going to happen to your chain rings? I mean, that is what a chamois was for, wasn't it? You know, drying your car out and leaving no smears. That's right. It's a slightly different chamois. 
But yeah, <laughs> I think we should do it about <laughs> some years what, in this context. What, what have you been drying my car with? <laughs> Show me, did you boil what's it? No. Oh. All oh, right, I mean, I, mean, I think it's a hack. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely saying hack, yeah. Yeah. I'm de I what you could do is ask, um, this sounds really weird, so it needs context. Um, so Lael Wilcox famously doesn't use chamois in her cycling shorts, she cuts them out. Mm. So you could, so she presumably has a stockpile of unused chamois. She could she could maybe use them to clean her bikes with. Start making some money off that. Yeah. It yeah. becomes a commercially available thing. There you go, yeah. Anyway, this I feel like we're on pretty dodgy ground here, so we better <laughs> swiftly move on. Oh gosh, right, um, are we saying hack, by the yeah. way? I think that's a hack, yeah. Uh, Paul Gowers, said, uh, hot feet from hot roads. Uh, on a recent cycling holiday, I experienced overheating feet in 35 plus temperatures and was very aware of how much heat was radiating off the road. I remember some school physics and the solution definitely helped, which is wrapping cycling shoes in tin foil. So there you wow. go. Um, hard to put on, but I estimate a 10% improvement. So there you go. Quite a Accurate estimation of it how is, much yeah. less hot your feet are, isn't it? I wonder if that does work. Hot feet are a nightmare, aren't they? They are a nightmare. I mean, I, got, I can't envisage it, but but the, you know, people do say black surfaces absorb more yeah. heat, don't they? So uh, maybe it does. Well, it looks cool. They've done a very good job. Uh, Paul has done a very good job. It's neat, isn't it? Yeah. It's basically a load of foil uh, cut around the gripper parts and the cleats of a road shoe, a city road shoe, by the looks of things. Uh, Ten percent difference. That's weirdly still a difference. good knowledge, Dan, of the undersole of a shoe that you can work out that it's well, a city. I think it is. I'm just looking at the uh, the holes in the side. They look city-like. I might be wrong. Let me know. I like the fact that you've attempted to guess and passed it off as if you know. <laughs> Oh yes, I recognise the cycling shoe from the bottom of it. Yeah, I'm the next uh, John Canning, so I think. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, oh, I think that's a hack, isn't I'm it? I'm going to go back. Yeah, if it works. 10% reduction, <laughs> sign me up. Uh, next up, this one from Liam saying, got some cheap alloy pedals and sharpened them using some wood flat files to make some, sh some sharp pins. To top it all off, the riding shoe of choice had some old rock ports as the soles are flat and quite soft. Oh, I don't know about that. Sharpening pedals, like I get that you want to make them grippier so mm. that your shoes have got a bit more pace, but I mean, call me an old fuddy duddy, but this is why clipless, pe <laughs> clipless mm. pedals, you don't need to make them sharp, they just clip onto your shoes. I have some horrific memories of uh, holding my shin from similar type pedals when, yeah. I, when I was trying to beat my own bunny hop record. <laughs> there we are. One of my feet slipped off the pedal. Uh, the pedal was forward, and when I landed, the one on the back obviously went Ooh. down, and it just slammed it into oh. my shin. I had like four. You know, you know it's bad, don't you? When it doesn't hurt, it, a it doesn't hurt for five or six seconds. You know that's going to be bad. And b, when there's no blood, and all you can see is the white bit. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like, this, this is just like a bad. hole. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Anyway, what was the record? I don't remember actually. I, I told you. Being didn't modest, I? aren't you? It was. I mean, it was reasonably high. Yeah, but it was nothing like Martin Ashton ended up doing. I wasn't world record height. But I, I'd made a bunny hopper meter in <laughs> technology at school. I must have told you this before. You must have done, but I've, I've forgotten. It was proper, it was good. I don't know what happened to it, but it was like two proper sturdy poles with, with like a tripod sort oh, really? of thing. And then a proper metal, like, but quite lightweight metal pole in the middle, oh. which you could obviously raise and lower. There you go. With measurements. I can't believe side. you didn't remember what, you, what bunny hop. Height you did. No. Anyway, there we go. Um, I think it was about three meters. <laughs> I, <laughs> I could give this a bodge. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm looking at it with trepidation, just at yeah. the thought of anyone's shins. Yeah. I just, I just feel like, yeah. If you're having to sharpen your flat pedals, just take the plunge mm. and go clipless. Okay. Um, yeah. There we go. Uh, anyway, MC Island sliders for the riders. Uh, I don't quite know what this is. A quick picture taken on the way down the Tourmalade descent after watching stage 14 of the tour last weekend. Sliders strapped to the saddlebag for maximum mobility when cheering on the rider. Oh, oh. I see, there you go. So uh, yes, a pair of uh, flip-flops strapped to the saddlebag. I think they're very nice looking canyon. I was gonna say, it's very clean, isn't it? Yeah. Not a speck on it. Nice color as well. It's kind of like sort of, um, like a, a sort of dusky blue color. I hope McIsland was not the person whose uh, flip-flops almost went into Tadej Pogacar's front wheel. 
Um, I missed that. Who was that? They actually didn't go at the tournament this year, did they? I was watching stage 14 of the tour oh, last yeah, weekend. Not the Oh yes, they did, didn't they? It yeah. Is, yeah. No, it wasn't that climb though. Anyway, that some yeah somebody's flip flop almost went into Pogacar's front wheel after they ran after him and uh, lost contact with their own flip flop. No. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, is that a hack or a bodge? Well, it's better than putting them in your pockets, I suppose. I'll go hack. Yeah, and save your cleats. Go on then. Oh, it's a fairly budget hack, isn't it? But you've got us on a technicality in that we can't work out that it's <laughs> why, why it's a bodge. Why would be a bodge? <laughs> yeah, basically. All right, well done. Uh, and we're going to finish up. By the way, with an update from Mike the Animal. Oh yes, Mike who, from uh, last week. Yeah, from last week's Hackle Bodge. Um, he said, the animal refers to my last name. I just spared you trying to read Zwierz, uh, which is animal in Polish. Oh, I see. So there you go. Well, you weren't here last week, were you? No. And for those of you who didn't watch last week's show, uh, I said that Mike the Animal, I said basically that somebody that's making their own username on YouTube or any social media platform, they shouldn't be the ones to decide if they are an animal. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, well, well explained. I'll let you off then, if that's uh, if that's what your name in Polish means, Mike. It's time now for caption competition, that part of the show where you get a chance to get your hands on a coveted GCN Camelback water bottle. All we got to do is put a witty caption in the comment section down below, and we'll start with the results. First of all, from last week, where we gave you this image. Uh, the image, for those of you listening rather than watching, being Jonas Vinigor. Uh, giving Binyam Gamay a fist bump there in the polka dot and green jersey respectively, and today Pagacha in the middle in his yellow jersey and shorts. Our winner this week is Burgles, who put caption, Jonas and Binyam discover that Pog beats scissors, paper, two rocks, and just about anything else. Yay! I like that very much. I also like rock, paper, scissors, to be fair. That's a great game. Isn't it really? It is, so I, li I like the reference to that. Um, yeah, that's super cool. Get in touch, Burgles, and we will uh, get your GCN Camelback water bottle out to you. This week's photo is, <laughs> is this one of Tadej Pogacar crossing the finish line in his uh, time trial kit and kind of doing like that sort of like Hulk pose. Well, he's got that Hulk sticker, hasn't he, on the front of his bar? It does, which is presumably it's ironic, is it? Doesn't seem to be with his celebrations like this one. Mm. I don't know how we describe this to podcast listeners. He's kind of sort of clenching his biceps and chest in a kind of bodybuilding fashion. Grrr. That's what he's doing, isn't it? Oh, that was the perfect audio description, I think, of the photo, yes. Yeah. Grrr. Um, anyway, I'll get you started. Do you know what, Si? I think I'm going to choose my YouTube username as Today the Animal. <laughs> I mean, I like that it's. Uh like current, obviously, yep. you know, nods to Mike there, but... Um, Since we recorded the end of Hack or Bodge, we've learned from a Polish colleague that he thinks it translates more like Beast. Mike the Beast. Mike the Beast could have been, rather than Mike the Animal. Maybe Mike the Beast was already taken. Maybe, yeah. Um, to me, Tade looks less like an animal here, more like a tadpole. <laughs> With that time trial helmet and this, sort of like, skinny little arms. Yeah, mm. tadpole as opposed to Tad A. He needs to watch my uh, video about the importance of strength, muscle mass and power, doesn't he? Well, power, it really does. Right? Yeah, it's not bad, is it? No. Yeah, anyway, get that. involved in the comment section down below with your best and wittiest captions. We'll pick a winner to give a GCN Camelback water bottle to next week. Very shortly, we'll let you know what's coming up on GCN over the next week. But first up, some comments from last week's video, starting underneath the GCN show, Aussie Stew. With his hair brushed like that, it looks like Connor is going to have his school photo taken. <laughs> yeah, I did I did notice that. And I was like, oh, Connor's looking very quaffed today. Paul, I was in a bit of a rush last week. You had to do the, the school run. It was drizzling, heavy drizzle. You know, the rain that makes you just really wet. Wet rain. And he rushed back and uh, yeah, he didn't know what to do with his hair. Oh, my word. Mm. Well, anyway, some good some good Aussie banter from Stu there. Uh, uh, Peanut EOD uh, was uh, questioning that professional cyclists get paid at all. So they get paid. I ride my bike so I can eat tacos and stay in the army. <laughs> <laughs> Very good indeed. Yeah, I like uh, that. We've got this from Magic M66 saying, "Incredible, Hank." Uh, no mechanical doping there. Next, having Sai do it on a cargo bike with kids. Uh, this is Hank riding up out Duez, wasn't it? On the yeah, I mean city no. bike. I don't think I could, even with uh, even with some even with a big motor. I there. don't think I'd want to. No, I also think that they would whine and moan 
they get bored <laughs> going at that speed up out to us. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, 323-wheeler said uh, that clunker made the Eurobike look and perform like a Colnago, which... <laughs> I think it's true, actually. We almost bought a £110 bike for some content the other day, but we couldn't find it in stock anywhere. No, it's sold out, isn't it? Yeah, normally. And actually, weirdly and ironically, our Eurobike has been stolen. Hmm. Yeah. Who would do that? Who would steal the Eurobike? Do you know what? The people that steal bikes, they probably don't know the difference between that and a, and a high-end Pinarello well, or clearly Bayer not. or Canyon, would they? Good luck getting rid of the Eurobike, guys. Uh, Ronald 5 DII. What a hero. For anyone on a more suitable bike, I suggest to add the Col de Solen after reaching Alpe d'Huez. Stunning scenery. Did the combo twice now and loved it. Uh, meanwhile, underneath the beetroot video with Connor last week, legal doping, uh, John Canning wrote in, you might know who John Canning did, oh, yeah. I refuse to beat around the bush. I think puns are the root of all comedy. There you go. Two puns in one. Probably. Boom. Uh, Wesley Hinkle said, uh, I've been using beetroot powder or chews for at least a year. Generally, it reduces blood pressure to the point that some individuals can get off medication. As a cyclist, it wasn't a power improvement, but a general capability improvement, a more sustainable feeling. And just around the house, I don't crave afternoon naps. That's some serious performance enhancement from beetroot chews there. Mm. I might give it a go. Well, yeah, m maybe you do. Maybe Connor, a sample size of one, just isn't enough to be scientifically valid. So maybe yeah. Dan needs to get on the chews and uh, see what you think. I mean, I'm sort of sceptical of that level of improvement mm. from a beetroot chew. But then placebo effect, as we've always said, is a placebo effect. It's still an effect, isn't it? It's still an effect, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jay Buffalo Man said, having used beetroot concentrate powder daily for about five years now, it's helped lower my blood pressure and I'd venture to guess improved my uh, oxygen uptake. Ran out of it for two weeks once and had a noticeable difference in my riding. Cheers. Well, there you go. Another one. I mean, maybe that would explain my riding as well. I haven't had any, so I need if I get on it, then perhaps maybe that explains why Tane is going so fast. Beetroot juice. Beetroot juice, yeah, yeah. there we go. Um, and, and isn't there cherry mm -hmm. juice as well? That's what they're having after all the stages, apparently. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's, I think that's right, isn't it? Well, anyway, so Connor was a little bit cynical about it, wasn't it? Mm. Or sceptical, yeah. should we say. But uh, but yeah, a few people in the comment section saying that it works for them. So as Dan said, whatever the reason why it works, if you feel like it works, then all power to you. Uh, right then, where are we up to? I don't know, actually. Oh, what's coming up on the show next week? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, on Wednesday, seven years of pro experience in seven minutes, AKA how not to get dropped. It's Connor <laughs> again, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm not sure it would be how not to get dropped, would it? It'd be like how to get dropped in style, or just like... <laughs> no, or just how to get dropped. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm really looking forward to that. Actually, um, what a cool idea! Seven years of pro experience in seven minutes. I mean, Connor has been around the block, hasn't he? Well, seven years, yeah. Seven years, Decent two grand tours, career. absolutely. Um, right then, uh, sorry, Thursday. Uh, how to eat on the bike. Uh, I'm starting to have more sympathy for people that struggle with that sort of thing because in my older age, I, I know I'm not that old, but I get stiffer. We've talked about this at the coffee machine, haven't we? <laughs> Find it a little bit harder to get into the back pocket and a little bit harder to turn around and see what's coming before I move out and make a turn in the road. You, what um, you need, Dan, is a little wing mirror hanging off the side of your helmet. Yeah, there's, there's a story to that, I'll tell you another time. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, it's, um, it's going to tell you how to eat on the bike, which, if you're new to the sport, or even been into it for a few years, is not always that easy. No. Uh, on Friday, we have a video loosely titled Car Brain. So you saw me getting a little bit animated earlier on about the issues that people face with, uh, with building bike sheds in their gardens and the fact that you're mm. not allowed to put bikes on the road, but you can park a car. Um, it's the tip of the iceberg, in fact, as I found out when making this video. So um, honestly, it kind of blew my mind. And once you know about this stuff, mm. like it will change your perspective forever. So that is Friday's video. Our designers have made a great thumbnail for that as well, haven't they? So they have, yeah. A lot of you will click on that one. Yeah, it's super cool. Uh, and then on Saturday... Uh, oh yeah, isn't you three riding 100Ks as fast as you can? That's right. Three of you, you, Ollie and Alex. Yeah, we decided that we'd get up one morning and see how fast we could ride 100 kilometers. So uh, Tailwind. Well, uh, you know what, actually, that was the plan. The weather's been so pants. 
and windy. We thought we might as well make the most of it and mm. have a rip Roy tailwind. You no, know, sod's law. The sun came out. It was baking hot, and there was no wind <laughs> slash a crosswind. But uh, anyway, check out how fast we did indeed manage to ride 100 kilometres. Mm. Um, yeah. And on Sunday, we've got the biggest climb in the Alps. I'm so jealous that Hank and Manon did this without me. So the Col de Gendry, which mm. uh, is about 26 kilometres long, goes up to 3,100 metres and finishes on gravel. So uh, Higher than the Cime de la Bonnet. Yeah. Manon said it was the hardest climb she has ever done. Oh, really? Yeah. Didn't get up it in zone two then? I don't think she was in zone two, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Check that one out. That should be super cool, that. Col de Gendry. Fantastic. All right, well, I think that's all for this week's GCN show. We'll be back at the same time next week talking more rubbish. <laughs>